Is Sandy, are you there? Oh, yeah, yeah. we're here. I, this is Bob. Uh, okay. Hello, David. Um, I'm Bob. Hi, Bob. I'm, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think what you've done is really uh, fantastic because I, I remember when I was, you know, kind of searching for the truth back in the middle 70s, somebody wrote a book called Kingdom of the Cults. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, Walter Martin. Yeah. And he went into the Mormon Church and the Seventh Day Adventists and and you name it, just about everything out there. But I I don't think he gave any honorable mention to uh, Eckenkar at the time. But, no, he you know, didn't know anything uh, about it. He didn't. He didn't know anything about it. No, no, no. I well, I didn't either. I never heard of him about it either until about fifteen years ago. Um, and I and I think that's really neat. Um, you know, one of the things that that I've learned since I've you know been with the uh, the new UUU group, um, Dwayne the Great Writer, and after reading some of his writings, I don't know if you've had a chance to read any or not. But one of the things that that kind of goes along with what you're saying is, um, you know, you know, I ask people, a lot of people, you know, like like you say, a lot of people are really confused. They have all these religious beliefs and everything, and and uh, a lot of people are caught up in these things and they get attached to them and everything. And one of the first things I I like to ask people is, you know, do, do you believe the biblical saying? which is from an ancient record that says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know, so that's one of the first questions I ask people and and most people will say, "Yeah, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth and and everything, you know, since then is history." But nobody stops to look back and say, "Well, what was there before God created the heavens and the earth? You know, what what was the God and what was it he created?" You know, I I don't know if you've asked yourself that question or not. But something had to be there in order to have a difference between uh, what we call cause and effect creation that we're all stuck in, we're all living in, kind of like in the movie The Matrix. We're living in this this uh, created illusionary reality or non-reality, whatever you want to call it. And outside of that, you have the real side, what we might call the real side, you know, what was there before all this? And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what we're doing is um, what we've realized is, is this is really true. Somebody created, created this illusion, this matrix, this illusionary life that we're living in, and they put us here to give us all these experiences. And then they've divided time. You know, time is an illusion also. But they've created these yugas. You know, you, you've had, you've probably heard the Golden Age and the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and all that, right? And down mm-hmm. at the end, at, you know, we're kind of like at the end of the end of the totem pole right now, kind of like in the Iron Age. And it wasn't until um, the the guys like uh, Rebzar Tires and and some of the other people came out, and and apparently what's what's at least the way I see it. Is we've reached the end of the yuga. The, the we're reaching. We're almost at the end of the last yuga, and so, um, so this entity we call it the all is has sent his guides into down in into this illusion. They've sent us inside the matrix. You know, like Neil. They, they've sent us inside the matrix, and they're looking for people that are ready and willing to get out of the illusion. And get on with the real life. Now, in the movie The Matrix, once you got out of that illusion, you were in a dark corridor and like a black, you know, a real dark suburb and ugly things all over the place. And I think that was, the movie made it like that, so why would you ever want to get out of The Matrix? But in reality, once you get out of the illusionary creation, things are so magnificent and beautiful, and it is, is something cannot be, you can't even consider it with your mind you're it is so great that it takes your actual soul level to understand and, and believe it and it's so fantastically beautiful and wonderful that that words really can't describe it some poets you know occasionally in their writings come close to um giving you an idea how how glorious the real side of life is once you get out of creation and and so 
um, one of the, that's kind of where we're at, or, or you know, that's you know, and all this stuff like on this planet, um, it's all contrived. Every religion on the planet, every government, is, is, you know, and and we can we can actually we actually actually have eyewitnesses like Lottie and Dwayne, and and not to mention all the real guys that have actually seen the reptilians that have come and created the human race. They actually created us and gave us part of their mind. And from the day that the humans were, were created, genetically created, we've been totally controlled. Every single religion, everything that we, we have in this illusionary creation is controlled by them. Just total control. And all this research, like, like you did and I did in, in the mid-'70s, all we're doing is there is no avenue of escape from this matrix except until just recently as as the all is has sent the real guides down into this creation to show us a way to guide us out of all this. And so that's kind of the way I see where we're at, and I've had experiences on the real side. Um, I've met Rebizar Tars. He invited me to his one of his upper rooms in a, in a mountain village, he had an upper room in, in this one little uh, little town, and it was just really fabulous. I'll tell you, meeting Rebazar Tires in person is probably one of the most exciting people you could ever meet on the real side. And uh, so anyway, that, that maybe that gives us an idea. So what we're doing is completely different than anything that you'll find written on the planet. It's, it's how to get, how to see through this illusion um, all the religions, all the governments are all here to keep us in endless cycles of reincarnation and, and just lock us in. And the guides are here to show us out. So, um, Claudia or Val, do you want to add or um, comment on that? Uh, me? Um, well, um, you know, I'm a kind of a, of a different sort on this, but I will say one thing that um, you perhaps are, are familiar with the Gnostics back in the – you know, 2000 years ago, they had a very similar idea that this was like a matrix. And the whole argument was that it was an illusion and there's their attempt was to try to wake up beyond it. So the idea that you mentioned, even, you know, more technologically, as you know, Elon Musk, <clears throat> founder of Tesla Motors, believes that this is a virtual simulation. And he made a very strong argument that, you know, 99.95 percent we're living in a, a a, you know, an illusion of some sort. He argues that it's probably some, some advanced civilization that computationally created like a game. Nick Bostrom out of Oxford University written a book called Superintelligence. And he also kind of gives this idea that the, the world that you see is, is a beguiling illusion. And you know, in Indian philosophy, the concept is called Maya. And Maya technically doesn't really mean illusion. It means that which betrays its real origin. And in a sense, as you know, our brains trick us. In fact, our brains evolved to trick us in the sense going niche in order to survive and pass on our genetic code. So this idea that you mentioned that, you know, we're kind of living in the matrix, it has been around, you know, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. The question is how people, you know, how they respond to it. You know, do they really buy into this is really an illusion or, or is this the, the only reality we're going to have? And when we're dead, we're dead. You know, as Steve Jobs says, you know, and Apple says, you know, the light's off and we still live beyond it, you know. Well, you know, you're you're, abso you're absolutely right. I I can't agree more. And, and in case you're wondering why the Gnostics had this idea, it's because the real guides were there talking to them, telling them the same thing that we're doing. They were there in person. It's basically whether whether it's an illusion or not. It's it's what reference are you going to go by? You know, some references are better than others. So. Even if Rebazar Tars is an illusion or not, um, it, make, it makes sense. And it's, I seem to become more aware. And that's where I'm going, I'm going off of is my awareness. Awareness supersedes everything, for me at least. So uh, if that works, then it makes sense and uh, go forward with it. You know, some things don't make sense and they're just detrimental they're not a benefit for everybody. Um, so um, I know that, well, I've read that you've had uh, lots of experiences with uh, the, uh, the 
what they used to be called the Eck Masters. And, and so h- how is your viewpoint on, on your experiences and your dreams and inner experiences? How do you see that? You're, oh, you mean me? Um, well, yeah, you know, David, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you have to understand, I met this interesting uh, man named Fakir Chand. I don't know if you've read about him. He died in 1981. He'd been meditating for 70 years in the Himalayan foothills you know, 10 to 12 hours a day. He had the ability to kind of consciously induce a near-death experience, you know, leave his body, go to higher levels. But what Fakir Chan realized is that much of what he was seeing on these higher planes of consciousness were projections of his own mind. And so he began to doubt his visions. And in so doing, because he doubted them, he'd go to the next level. Like, for instance, you guys have made the argument that if you doubt the reality that we're presently seeing, it, you get access to a higher reality. But when you get to that next stage... You also have to take that same skepticism, and this is what Fikir Chan had pointed out. So for me, when I ever have these amazing dream experiences or even meditation experiences of whatever it may be, I don't take them to be separate from projections of my own mind. And because I don't, it allows me to be free from those. What I mean is, again, going back to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When you die, according to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you'll see all sorts of apparitions and gods and gods and all sorts of amazing things. And you'll take them to be real. But the minute you take them to be real, they entrap you because now you, you've bought into this illusion. So their argument is, is don't buy into what you see as objectively real. Rather, continue that skepticism and that doubt, and then you get released from that next stage. At least that's their argument. Well, for Kir John, who was a practitioner of Shabbat Yoga, had the same idea. So for me, my skepticism about Twitchell and all that stuff is not that, you, granted, you guys are having amazing experiences. I don't de- de- deny that for five seconds. For real, like in some historical, objective way that Twitchell tried to do, and yet there's no evidence, at least at this level, that Sudar Singh and Rebbe Zartars and Yabu Sakabi are historical figures. Now, that doesn't mean people don't have amazing experiences. They do. It all comes down to this. How do we interpret it? And they, as you guys point out, there's a variety of, of, of ways of interpreting. So it all depends on what works for you and what doesn't. It's what, what's demonstrated. So uh, when people don't care for the earth, they harm the earth, I mean, they're demonstrating their ignorance of, of you know, how things work in nature. So what we do is start off with, with the environment all natural environment and uh, try to help people wake up to that fact that, you know, it's, it's their survival that's in, in, in peril here. And that can yep. be um, taken to the all levels. And I'm not just talking about nature, but when we talk about all natural environment, it's all the, all the levels of creation, like Bob mentioned, it's all the psychic levels, metaphysical, philosophical, all these areas of planes or whatever you want to call them, um, it's it's being it's being um, it's, it's a demonstration. Um, what you get from the references from these beings and through your meditations and everything, um, you use that as as just a reference, a point of reference to to go further. I mean, for me at least, I um, I've quit being skeptical about the experiences. I mean, this is my sharing my personal experience. I started a long time ago with physical, a physical practice. I used to do Tai Chi. So I used to put an intent into the movements and I would get a response. I noticed I'd get a response from my intent. Life would, would bring me back something. And from there, I kind of learned how this works. There's a process where it, you, um, if you're skeptical, then of course you're, you're blocking yourself, you know, you're restricting yourself. But if you're open to listening and with a true, pure and sincere intent, if you, if you put it out there, it'll respond. And that kind of got me to, into Eck and Carr and then to, well, I was in self-realization for a while, fellowship, Paramahansa and Scientology for a little bit. And then Eck and Carr for 40 years. And, and then, here I see it's kind of came full circle where I see how how just the sincerity and purity that you have and you put out there with uh, a true intent 
we really uh, value intent, especially when you lose the physical body and go to the, the real side, we call it. Uh, without an intent, you sort of, you know, you'd be lost. We've had a lot of experiences like Claudia and um, Sandy have uh, uh, gone and visited people who have lost their body and they don't know where they are, basically. You know, they don't have, they didn't have intent, so they're wandering around. They don't have the physical anymore, the, the, the five senses as anchor points. So they're, they're kind of lost. After a while, they get pulled back into the physical again for another reincarnation. So they're, they're disoriented in a way. But, so intent is very important in terms of, uh, of moving. I, I don't want to say moving it, but just the, the recognition of what this reality is that we're talking about. Yeah, no, that Sandy's makes, there. Sandy's there. Sandy, yeah. Sandy, that makes good sense. Yeah, is Sandy there? Or does she have laryngitis tonight? Today? Yeah, no, this is, this is Sandy. Okay. I'm Sandy. I'm Bob's okay. wife. Okay. Love to hear from you, Sandy. For a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I want to say I too have had uh, many experiences with Ray Bazaar and Paul Twitchell, even Rami Nuri, Gopal Das. I had been in Ekankar for 50 years. Wow. And I had sat in uh, bars where Paul had actually talked. Um, I knew Paul's personal physician, who was Dr. Alfred Sisk, and I was good friends with his daughter, so we got a lot of information through uh, her father. Um, what I want to say is, um, I prior to finding the new presentation, I had had a dream. And in that dream, I was given the new you, you, you word. And I, since I was still in Ekankar at the time, I thought, oh, is this going to be another initiation as we get in Ekankar? Uh, but, of course, we can't talk about the word and we can't talk about the experience, uh, which makes a new presentation so much better because we can talk about our experiences. Anyway, I, I did this uh, new you, you, you for uh, saying it for a couple of weeks. And in a couple of weeks, I had another dream uh, where I was sent a letter in the dream state, and it led me to uh, Duane Hepner and all of his uh, books and his writings and teachings that he has on the Internet. And I, uh, I was so excited reading them, I thought, oh, my gosh, I have to tell my husband. So I ran downstairs and said, hey, you've got to read this. And he did, and uh, we actually quit Ekankar the very next day, because at night, it was at night, I had found Dwayne's works and Dwayne the Great Writer. And um, I, uh, like I said before, I have a lot of experiences with, we call them the real guides now before they were called Ek Masters. But uh, even in Ekankar, I had experiences with uh, Ray Bazaar and the other real guides. And it's been, uh, I want to go to uh, music a little bit here. Um, you know, music, you only have seven notes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, if you want to go that way. And But yet I understand we have lower octaves and higher octaves. And you, yet if you have studied music a lot, uh, you will realize that these composers, you'll, you'll hear something from Beethoven, oh my gosh, that sounds just like the, the phrase from Mozart, and you will see it happen in many composers where things are repeated through the ages, just like works are repeated through the ages. And really, uh, truth is truth. It doesn't no ma matter where it's coming from, but, it, but it's truth. And, and you see things repeated, you think, well, this one's plagiarizing that one. Is that really what's happening? Or did they plagiarize somebody else? And all the way down through history, if you go backwards. So, um, I, you know, where does it stop? Where does it end? It, it really doesn't. Um, like I said, truth is truth, no matter uh, how you uh, interpret it. Um, I have had, like Claudia has, experiences uh, with people who have passed over, who have been in Ekankar, uh, such as Marjorie Klemp, uh, one of my good friends. Uh, his name was Don. I just won't say his last name. 
But um, they they truly do not know where they are when they cross over. Uh, they really don't. Uh, all the promises that were made uh, about you being taken, let's say you, you get a, a fifth initiation and you think that the master is going to come and take you to the fifth plane and you just sit back on your laurels. That doesn't happen. I've seen way too many Ekas pass over not knowing where they are uh, and not even willing to talk to anyone or the real guides. They just kind of sit in their little da corner, uh, totally unaware, and not even making it out of, I knew an eighth initiate, not even making out of, out of the astral plane or the lower astral as, the, uh, as it was. And uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, we have to take the risk. We have to be an adventurer. 